let's get started. So um, just a reminder, assignment due, two is due today. Um, assignment three I'll get out today or tomorrow, um, depending on how the lecture notes go. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, chaining, which I started last time. Um, by the way, the, the notes from last lectures are out. And then I'll talk about focusing, um, about the bipoles briefly, and then about quantifiers if there's time at the end. Um, so remember last time we classified the connectives as being positive or negative based on which rules are invertible. So the negatives I'm um, just going to write uh, A minus. Okay. Um, does anybody remember which ones were the negatives, the ones whose right rule was invertible? Okay. A lolly B. Okay. With. Okay, and the positives. Where are all the other ones? Okay, so the negatives means that the right rules are invertible and the positives means that the left rules are invertible, okay? Um, now, at, we didn't put atomic formulas in here because at some level it doesn't make sense to say that the left or right rule for atomic formulas is invertible, okay? Because atomic formulas have no left or right rules associated with them, okay? But it's still going to be important to classify because when we have atomic formulas, they kind of like proposition of variables. They stand for arbitrary propositions in some sense, right? We want to be able to do a proof where we have a, a, an atomic propositions. We want to be able to substitute arbitrary propositions for those. And so we can decide whether we have an, when we have an atomic proposition, whether we want it to stand for a negative or positive formula. And it turns out it is our choice. So there is negative atomic formulas which go up here and there's positive atomic formulas which go into this line. Okay. And so they will behave differently with respect to chaining. Um, uh, but with respect to uh, inversion, we can't test our criteria okay, because there are no left or right rules for them. Okay. But we'll have to worry about this when we get to chaining. Okay, so these were the, these were the connectives. So now let's write out the rules. Okay, and we're going to pay particular attention to the chaining uh, idea. Okay, and the idea was, if you remember from the example last time, that we focus in on one particular formula, and then we can apply the non-invertible rules only to that one formula. Okay, so we have some. Um, so, for example, for the implication, the right rule. I'm going to leave out the gamma for the moment. Okay, to not to have to write so much. So, if you're trying to prove a lolly b. Okay, we just assume A, and we prove B, and that's the lolly right. And there's not more, more to say about that because we're just going to do it like that because that rule is invertible. Okay. What's the. So the arrow? Is the lolly on top? Ah, wrong arrow. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the rule in the, in the chaining system. Now, the left rule, we're only going to be able to apply. If this formula on the left is in focus, okay, so we're going to write it like this. If we have A lolly B, and we're allowed to apply an inference to it while we're trying to prove C, then we can break it up into two from delta V prove A, and we have to retain focus, so now we're only allowed to apply things here. And B stays in focus here, and we're trying to prove C. So that would be the lolly left row. Okay. Um, so how do we get there? Okay. We get there by having the following rule. So if we have delta, and there's an A in that, when trying to prove C, then we're allowed to put that into focus. 
So this is the focus left row, okay? But there's going to be a condition on that. We're going to only be allowed to do that under which circumstances? If A is negative, right? So that means that its rule is not invertible. If this is invertible, we should be breaking it down with the inversion for the, for the left rule. We shouldn't be focusing on that in order to chain things together. And you can guess how the other, what the other rule looks like. Delta arrow A. You have a focus right rule. And you would like to put it on focus here. But there's going to be a condition on A. Yeah, it must be positive for the same reason as before, because the right rule here, if it's positive, would, um, um, if it were negative, the right rule would be invertible, and then we wouldn't try to focus on that. We only focus on the things that are not invertible. So there's a condition here and here that restricts the application of this rule. Um, okay, now eventually we're going to fall out of focus with these rules. And that happens when we're on the left and the formula is no longer negative. So if the formula becomes positive, then we're on the left, it becomes something that we can apply inversion to. So when we're on the left and we're focused on something positive, by well, trying to prove C, um, then we just lose our focus, okay? And we go back to a sequent without that focus formula. And similarly over here, if the right-hand side, if you're focused on something which happens to be negative, then we just go back and take the formula itself. So sometimes these things are called the blur rules because the opposite of focus. So that's the blur left, and that's the blur right rule. Okay. So we have to go through all the connectives um, in order to make sure in order to write around the whole system, I'm going to not do all the connectors, but I'll do some subset. Um, but I want to point out a couple of things about these rules. Okay, so what we want to proof at the end. Okay, well, first of all, um, we want to relate delta double arrow a to delta single arrow a. Okay, so this is a cut-free sequence calculus with atomic initial sequence. And this is now the restricted calculus. That's the one over there. Okay, and we want to make sure that they, in some sense, that you can prove this if and only if you can prove that. Okay, so without seeing any more rules, from here to here is actually going to be quite easy. If something is provable with these rules, it will be provable over here. Why? Why do you suspect that might be the case? Yeah. Yeah, right, because the only difference between the two systems is going to be there are some formulas in focus, okay? So we just erase the brackets and what happens, and then the premise of these two rules are the same, so we drop that rule, we drop this rule, we drop this rule, and we drop this rule, and all the other rules are carried over identically. So it's very easy to see that you can go from here to here because we're only restricting the application of the inference rules, okay? Now to go from here to here is also very easy to see, if you view these rules the way I've written them here, okay? And the reason is the following. I didn't say anything about the fact that there can be only one formula in focus, okay? So you can easily go from here to here, okay? By simply, if you want to apply, say, a left rule to an implication, we put that formula in focus, we apply that rule, okay? And we continue from there on, okay? Um, the important part is that in the sequence here, the way we wrote them down here, if there's a bracket, there's only one formula in brackets, okay? So either there's none, which is possible, okay? Um, like if we, if we start out without none, then there will be none after we apply these rules. But if there's a bracket, there's, you know, at most, at most one is either gonna be on the left or it's gonna be right, but no more than one, okay? So the trick of this whole thing to go from here to here is to deal with the structural restriction on the sequence that there's, that there's at most one formula that's in focus in a sequence. Okay. Um, okay. So whenever we write this, we mean at most one formula in focus. And we have to keep reminding ourselves that that's the case when we write these things. 
Now, one generalization we have to make right away is that um, now the bracket thing is not really a formula. Bracket A is not really a formula. Okay, it's a kind of a meta notation for a formula being in focus. So, for example, when we apply implies left here, we have to think about: Is it possible that the right hand side might actually be a formula in focus? And what's the answer to that? Could it be that there's a formula in focus here? No, because. Right, we just said there's a restriction at most one formula in focus. So this cannot be something in focus because that would be inconsistent. You wouldn't consider such sequence. So this is just going to be an ordinary formula, right? Um, what about here? Is it possible that this is a formula in focus? Well, it could be in the conclusion, but then we're not allowed to apply the inference rules because there wouldn't be two things in the premise. Okay. Well, we're going to have to be careful. We're going to have to look at each of the rules, make sure um, they're not, we're not violating this. Okay. In general, we might have to consider a right-hand side, which might be either formula or formula in focus. We have to make sure to allow both possibilities. Okay. Ron, you're puzzled. I was reading the brackets to define different judgments. Yeah. Not the case. Well, you can look at it different ways. You can also define, you can also say we have three judgments. One is, um, say, provability without anything in focus. Provability with one thing in focus on the left, and another one with one provability of focus on the right. Okay, so I'm just going to do it a little bit less sort of pedantically. Okay, and just saying that well, we have the sequence, and we just have this global restriction that there's one thing, at most one thing in focus. Okay. Um, okay, um, we probably should do a couple of more rules to see what's going on with these things. Um, Let's look at um, tensor. It's always good to um, take something negative and something positive and look at both of these. Okay. So what is the tensor right rule? Okay. So the way we do this, we first write it down the way we're used to, and then we consider what happens with things in focus. So tensor right, and we have delta. A delta plus B. Okay. Are there any brackets in this rule? Anything in focus? Oh, Bob, you're nodding. Okay. The right-hand side has to be in focus because it's a positive formula, so it's not invertible on the right. So we can only apply this rule if this thing happens to be in focus, and then it's always inherited by the subformulas. Okay, and the left rule. Okay, so we would have delta A tensor B. We'll just break it down into A comma B. Okay, so what's the right hand side? Okay, so we can say C. Now is it possible that the right hand side is focus is in focus and we can still apply that rule? Um, well, this formula is not in focus, so there's no reason the right-hand side would have to be a formula. You could still apply that rule. It wouldn't violate our condition, okay, if the right-hand side turns out to be in focus. So the way we're going to deal with that is that we're going to say, in this case, the right-hand side is a small gamma, and we define somewhere what the gammas are. They're sort of like the right-hand side counterpart of a delta. So gamma is going to be either just some formula or some formula in focus. Okay, so we only have to write the rule once, otherwise we'd have to write it twice. Okay. And also, implicitly, we're saying that delta can contain things, not just formulas, but also formulas in brackets, except at most one. Okay, okay so that's, uh, these are the tensor rules. Um, Okay, let's do a few more. Let's do the unit, one. Okay, what is the right rule? Okay, so normally it would say this. 
Do we need to require anything to be in focus? One has to be in focus for the same reason it has there. It's positive. So if you want to apply a right rule, it has to be in focus. The left rule doesn't have to be in focus because that's the invertible rule, except that the right-hand side might be in focus or not. We don't care about that. Okay. Okay, so let's think about the atomic formulas. Okay, and that's where part of the trickiness comes in. Okay, so when I'm focused, I fall out of focus when I come to a negative formula. So it's perfectly okay um, for a negative formula, atomic formula B on the right. Okay. Um, okay. And I could be focused on a negative atomic proposition. Okay. And in that case, I'm allowed to close off the proof. Okay. So I'm usually focusing on something negative, okay? Because I continue to be on something negative, I'm not allowed to drop out of focus because I only can drop out of focus um, when I come to something positive. So eventually, if I bottom out at something which is still negative and I haven't actually um, finished my focus, okay, then I can only succeed if actually so happens that the exact same formula is already on the right-hand side, okay? So this is a surprising thing, at least it was to me, that if you just take this rule, everything, you know, everything in the logic stays okay because it's a very strong restriction. So the right-hand side could be, I don't know what, a tensor. Okay. Then this rule wouldn't apply. You couldn't focus on an atomic formula here if the right-hand side doesn't happen to be exactly the same atomic proposition. Okay. Um, okay. Now, conversely, if you're focused on a positive atomic formula on the right, then you're not allowed to drop out of focus because it's not a negative formula, so you have to do something. Um, but there's nothing you can do because you can't break it down any further. Okay? So you're allowed to succeed only if the left-hand side is exactly P. And if it's not P, okay, then you must fail. Okay? So that's a very strong restriction into your, in your proof search procedure. Okay. And we saw the example last time that I put up where we saw that a certain focus, a certain set of rules only allowed a very deterministic proof search because other attempts would fail because of this particular restriction here. Okay. By the way, I should mention, it's in the lecture notes, but um, this idea of focusing is due to Andreoli from a paper in 92. Um, and he applied it in order to uh, give a logic programming language. So in other words, uh, an operational semantics for proof search that can be used as a programming language for, um, for linear logic. So the language that he proposed has never been used, but focusing has been used all over the place for many, many different kinds of applications. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let's see. So I should, <coughs> the interesting part of these rules where there is an interesting restriction is here and here. Okay, um, because we can only apply this if there's not already a formula in focus. And we can apply this only if there's not already a formula in focus. Okay. Now for the other rules, we don't have to worry about that because you know, this will be the only focus if we drop off, we get zero. This is the only thing we get zero formulas in focus. There's nothing to worry about here. Here if there's at most one, it'll be this one. Then in each of these cases, there will be at most one. <laughs> Here, if the conclusion has most one in focus, the premise does, and so on. So we don't have to worry about these conditions on the sequence, as long as we check them here. So we would never focus on something if it's not already in focus. Okay. All right. So that's um, so this system um, I call uh, uh, the chaining system, and it's also called weak focusing sometimes. Um, and uh, it goes back to Laurent, and I actually don't remember the year of that paper. Okay. Yeah. So uh, um, Rob will look it up, um, the particular year. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the system. Okay. And the big restriction, like I said, is the thing that the, on the formula in focus. Two thousand four. Two thousand four. Okay. Andreoli was 92, so, yeah. So yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so let's, um, let's see. So what we want to do now is we want to prove that this system really is, um, we already know it's sound, okay, because that's a fairly straightforward property, but we want to show that it's complete with respect to this notion of derivability. Right? So that um, if you have, if you have a cut-free sequent proof here, then you can find a focus proof. That is the hard direction because there's many fewer proofs over there than there were before. Okay. Okay, how do we do this? I'm soliciting suggestions. How do we prove? Well, if you don't have a good idea, you try. <laughs> okay? What is the obvious thing to try? Induction. Induction, excellent. Okay. <laughs> Five points extra credit, okay. Um, see, that's how easy it is to get extra credit, you just say induction, okay. Um, okay, so what are we given? We're given one proof and we have to construct another one. The obvious thing tries to do induction. And if it fails, then we try to learn from the failure and try to figure out what's going wrong, okay. All right, so, um, okay, so let's try. Um, now, I give this speech usually in all of my classes, so probably you've heard it, but there's a question of when you start with an induction proof, do you try the easy or the hard cases first, right? So um, if you try the easy cases first, it's nice because at least for some amount of time you believe that you're on the right path, right? And you're making progress and you're gaining intuition, right? And of course, the counter argument is for the hard cases, if it's not going to go wrong, you might as well find out sooner instead of spending all this time. Now, this is not a completely trivial question because there's, it's complex because there are many connectives compared to classical logic or even intuitionistic logic. So there's many cases. So you could be going for quite some time, like for weeks, okay, until you figure out, oh, I should have checked that case first. It obviously doesn't hold, okay. So I'm an optimist, so I always start with easy cases, okay. The rest will work out anyway, okay. So let's do um, initial sequence, right? So what do the initial sequence in this case look like? So proof is by induction on D, and this is D. So case, anybody remember the initial sequence for this? Yeah? So we had the identity rules restricted to atomic types? We had the identity rule restricted atomic types, okay. All right, so we have um, D looks like this identity rule at some atomic type P um, because it was P arrow P. Okay, so now we have to distinguish two cases, okay, whether we declare P to be positive or negative, right, because our focusing system over there is slightly different depending on what, what decision we made, okay, and whatever decision we made, it shouldn't depend, you know, the proof should still go through. The decision on how to assign polarity to atomic formulas should be arbitrary. So subcase, P is declared to be positive. By the way, I should say that in several theorem provers that I built, um, with uh, first with Khaled Chowdhury, he was a, a PhD student here, is now at INRIA, and then also with, um, with Sean McLaughlin, figuring out what polarity assigned to the, to the atomic propositions is like the crucial decisions. You know, everything else is like, ah, uh, okay. We just follow your nose and you do the right thing. But we could never figure out a good way to look at the problem and decide how to assign the to polarity to atomic propositions. As we'll see at the end in some examples, it completely changes the search space to say, de depending on what you do there. So there aren't lots of atomic propositions. We yeah. not just try all of the polarity assignments. Right. So if there might be, unfortunately, <laughs> what happens in the propositional case yeah, so in the propositional case, usually it might be three or fours. You could do that. In the first order case, it's going to be a proposition P applied to some terms. So you have infinitely many atomic proposition. So assigning polarity could be a difficult thing. Okay, so if P is positive, what do we do? 
So we have to prove that P plus proves P plus. How do we do that? Yeah? Yeah, we have to focus on the right, okay? Um, which is this one, and we can do that because this is positive, right? We can't focus on the left because P is not negative, so we have to focus on the right. And so, and fortunately, we arrange it so this is a rule. Okay, now if P is negative, what do we do? Focus on the left, okay. All right, excellent. So those, these two cases, so this case is handled, okay? Um, so my optimism so far has not been misplaced, okay? All right, so. Okay, so now I'm gonna, somebody wanna propose a difficult case to try? Um, I guess we don't have that many cases on the board, right? So linear implication or tensor? Uh, let's do linear implication. Okay, so case looks like this. We have delta, delta prime, and A implies B. Okay, so from delta we have to prove A, delta prime together with B, we have to prove C, and then we conclude C. Okay, so this is uh, D1 and D2, okay. All right, so what do we do next? You know, this proving procedure is fairly mechanical, and in fact, I've built theorem provers to provide, which proceed exactly as we're gonna do now. Okay, which is, well, you're trying to prove this, you have subderivations, apply the induction hypothesis. What else are you gonna do? Somebody just lost five points extra credit by not saying that. Okay. So delta A is the induction hypothesis on D1. Okay. Um, how do we get the induction hypothesis on D2? Well, we just apply it, right? So what do we find from that? Um, delta prime and B, pure C, that's by the induction hypothesis on D2. And what we have to prove here is delta and delta prime together with A implies B, proof C. Right? So we have to fill this gap. So we can't apply the left rule here, can we? Well, it's not in focus, right? So we would have to focus it. Okay, so if we focus it, what happens? Okay, let's see. So, so I'm, let's just proceed optimistically, okay? Let's put this thing in focus. Okay, now we can apply the left rule, correct? So on here we have to take from delta, we have to prove A in focus. And over here we would have to show that this is the case, right? So that would be, that would not be the left rule. I'm sorry, that would be the focus left. And this would be the implies left. Okay? So it would be okay if you can prove that, if you can prove A, then we can prove A in focus. And over here, if you can prove C from delta prime and B, we can prove it from B in focus. Okay? Carl is skeptical because? Right, if B, is if B is positive here, right, then this would be a rule, yeah. right? And if A is negative here, this would be a rule. But if, it, but if it's not, if this one is negative, or A over here is positive, we're not allowed to do that. And in fact, it's not even true that from here you can go to here. Can somebody think of a counterexample? We have a negative atomic proposition. Okay, so let's see. Um, everybody remembers what's positive and negative at this point? Okay, so if we have, if, what do you mean A is, I mean over here? Okay. So we're focused on P minus. 
And what's delta? P minus. Okay. So what would happen if it's focused on a negative proposition, then we can blur. Right? So we'd have to show that P minus gives us P minus. Then I would focus on the left. And that's allowed. So if this is P minus, I can still complete the proof. Okay. So I'm looking for something where I can prove it. Okay, but I cannot prove it if I'm focused on the right hand side. What kind of pr proposition would have this kind of property? Any ideas? Well, there's only two things to try. You can try positive or negative. We already ruled out the atomic case, right? So some compound positive or negative. So which one is it going to be? It has to be, it cannot be negative because it's negative, you blur and you have the rule, right? So it has to be positive. Okay. So, um, but we have that one, that, that, this one is a positive formula, right? And this should certainly be true, right? And we know it's true. Right? That's just the identity and we've already proven that that's admissible. Okay. We've proven it's admissible in the double arrow calculus, so let's assume we can prove that. Okay. Um, so what do we do now? Okay, what about this? What, what rules can we apply here? Okay. Um, okay. So if we apply only the, the, the rule to the focus, rule over here, then we would get stuck because a tensor B would have to go to one side or the other. Okay. Um, but this is something I didn't think of, is that we still have the weak focusing system, so you could actually apply the left rule here. Okay. Um, so Rob should have frowned a little harder, okay. um, which is that, uh, in fact, this is, I believe that it is true. Okay. And if you can prove it in focus, if you can prove it out of focus, you can prove it in focus. Okay. Um, okay, so if you follow that line of thought, right, we should be able to prove that as a lemma. Since we can't find a counterexample um, and it would complete our proof, right, we should do that. Now, um, what other cases would we have to consider here? Because we only want to do that if that really, is that the right thing to finish our proofs, right? So what other things could go wrong? Um, let's do the implication right. If we did the implication right, what would happen? So in this big, in this proof, right? So if the last proof was the implication right. So, the implication, right, we apply the induction hypothesis and we get this, right, because it's a premise. And then we just reapply the rule because no focus is required. Okay. So the implication, right, is an easy case because it's the same rule on both sides. The hard part is implication left. We already considered atoms, okay, by illegal induction, the rest of the cases are all the same. Okay. So the only thing we need to worry about is, I guess, this lemma, okay. You can kind of believe that, okay? So the question is if this is the case. So I've never considered this theorem before, okay? Um, so now we believe this, modulo this lemma. We'll see if we can figure it out. So the lemma would be if 
delta arrow a, um, then delta arrow a in focus. Okay. Uh, clearly, we don't want to have this as a primitive rule, okay, um, because we only want to drop out of focus when the right-hand side is positive. But we do want to show it's admissible if you want our proof over there to go through. Okay. So you want to show that this rule is admissible. Okay. So how would we do this? Hmm? Induction. Induction. Yes, I go to you into saying that, but that's not the way to do it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you did it by induction, you would analyze the structure of this here. Okay. Let's consider the easy case. The easy case, the last rule is which? Um, no, it would actually be focus, right? This one. Right? But then, the, because then the premise is the conclusion that we want, right? And so the hard part would be if it's some other rule, right? Then we would have to figure out how to proceed, okay? But generally, um, there is a trick we can use, and we used it last time. If it's possible, okay, in many cases, we may be able to use cut, okay? Instead of doing structural induction, then all the induction is contained in the admissibility proof of cut, and we don't have to do so many inductions, right? We put all the difficulty in this one place. Um, okay. So if we had proven the admissibility of cut for the single arrow, which we haven't yet, but if we had that, okay, uh, would be able to go from here to here. What would we have to be able to do? Yeah? Okay, so we would have a focused version of identity like this, and then we would apply cut here, which would be hopefully an admissible rule, and this would be the focused version of identity, okay, and we would get our conclusion, okay. So cut alone doesn't do it, okay. We'd also need some kind of identity that says, if we have A, we can prove A in focus, okay. And secondly, we would have to show the admissibility of cut. If you had those two things, then we would be able to go from the appeal to our induction hypothesis to what we want to show from here to here. Okay. All right. So now we have reduced it down to two things, cut and identity, which is very good. That's a good place you want to be in. Because if you did a good design of the system, you know, then cut should hold. If you do a good design of the system, identity should hold. Okay. So Whenever I write down these systems before I even try to prove most other things about them, I try to make sure they're cut and identity hold. And if they don't, okay, something is questionable. Okay. All right, so now I need to make room over here. But you can see that we have reduced it to this. So if these are admissible, then we're done here. Okay, so now. Uh, let's do identity first. Okay. So identity. Um, I actually don't know which one is harder, so I can't go the easy way this time because I don't know what is the easy way. Okay. All right, so we want to show that in this sequence calculus, from A you can get to A. All right, so that's, we want to show that's true for any A. Okay, so that's a theorem. Okay, how do we show this? How do we usually show identity? You only get extra credit if you say induction and on what? Induction on A, excellent. Okay, so we have to show that, so case, um, if it's atomic, we have to show P arrow P, okay? Two subcases, P could be positive or negative. If it's positive, focus on the right. If it's negative, focus on the left, okay? So that case was easy. So let's say if we have, um, if A is A1 tensor A2, so what we have to show is that from A1 tensor A2, we can show A1 tensor A2. How do we do that? Okay. 
Yep, we apply the left because the left rule is invertible. We haven't checked this with the system, but that's a good place to start. A1, A2 proves A1 tensor A2. Now, focus on the right. A1 tensor A2, focus right, and we have A1 comma A2 over here. And now, tensor right, that's why we focused. And we're smart enough to put A1 over here. And we're smart enough to put A2 over here. And now? Hmm? Uh, OK, but the induction hypothesis is A or A. It doesn't say anything about brackets. OK. Second version is obviously this one. And the third version is bracket A over A. Why don't I have to prove bracket A proves bracket A? Because you can't have two brackets. Right. Only one bracket in the sequence. OK, remember these things. OK, so now by this induction hypothesis, we're done, right? OK. Um, all right, so everything's easy. Now we have to worry about this thing well, right? Okay, so how do we prove that? Okay, so if you have A1 tensor A2 proves A1 tensor A2, okay, you can apply tensor left. That was the trick that we had before. Okay, and then we can apply the right rule, and then we can appeal to the induction hypothesis 2i, right? Okay. OK, um, so, so you can trust me on the rest. Right? There's not much more going on here. Okay? But it is crucial that even when one formula is in focus, you can apply the invertible rule on the other side okay, in order to decompose it. Once you make that, then you can make this proof go through. Okay. So, but you have to prove these three things at the same time, I believe. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so we have the identity. Okay, so we have that part here. That was actually part two. That's actually what we needed in order to go from here to here. Um, and uh, now we need to worry about cut. Okay, so we have identity. Oops. Uh, cut. And we want to prove it's admissible. Okay, so what does it look like? So we have delta arrow A, delta prime and A, okay, gamma. And then delta, delta prime proves gamma. Okay, and we have D, and we have E, and this should be a dashed line because that's what we're actually trying to prove. Okay, dashed line is hard to do with a big piece of chalk. Okay, so how does the proof of admissibility proceed? And then we'll have to see if we have to modify anything from our previous proof. Okay, um, if this is a side formula here and this is a side formula here. How do we proceed? Now let's look at this one first. Let's say there's, a, there's an inference here in delta. Remember this from cut elimination proof last time? How does it work? OK, there's a left rule applied here. Then we apply the induction hypothesis with all of this proof over here and the proof of the premise, and then we apply that rule. Right? So we're pushing up the cut. Yep. Um, we will fail for the focus L. OK. So we have to worry about whether we can still do that if we actually introduce a focus. OK. Actually, let me write this down. There's a restriction here. There cannot be a focus in delta and delta prime at the same time, because then the conclusion would have two focus in it. Right? 
So just by writing this down, I already kind of assume that there is one formula in focus in the whole thing. Otherwise, the conclusion wouldn't make sense. Understand that? OK. So if there's a focus left rule applied over here, OK, um, that could be if there's no focus here already. OK, so then we cannot necessarily push it up into here, because if there was a focus over here, maybe on the right or in delta prime, we would get illegal cut, right? We're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to push it up. So what do we do in that case? Okay. Would it work if in D we said that we had to be focused on A and in uh, E squiggle thing we also had to be focused on A? That way when we were done, that, that way we, since if those formulas are well formed, then they, then like when we're done we have zero focuses and can go focus on something else. Okay. So there's another version of this. looks like this. OK. Right. OK, so if you focus on A here too, you focus on something that's here and here both and focus at the same time. Um, so that case is relatively easy. OK. Because there can't be any focus rule on either side. And just push it up and eventually the, the focus brackets have to drop off from one side or the other. Okay. And so then we get to this case. Okay. Where um, you have something like this and something in focus here. And why am I interested in looking at the case where something is out of focus on one side and in focus on the other? Okay. So the reason I'm interested in this particular case, if you look at the rules, if you're trying to match up a right rule with a left rule, OK, each connective is invertible on one side and is eligible for chaining on the other. So the action in the proof is when it's out of focus on one side and in focus on the other. Or with tensor, it will be in focus on the right and out of focus on the left. OK, so that's one thing something interesting happens. So if we're in this case, and it was the last thing introduced here, and the last thing introduced here, OK, then we can apply our cut reduction. And that's still going to work because what happens is that because it's in focus here, it's going to be in focus in both premises. Because it's not in focus, it's not going to be in focus. So we, cut, we get cuts of the same type okay, when we push up the cut, when we make the cuts of the subformulas. Okay. But we do need the other direction also. So we need another version of this where this is delta arrow A in focus and delta prime A out of focus goes to C. Okay. So we also need that case because, you know, here, the formula A goes from focus on the right-hand side, to be, on the left-hand side to being focus on the right. So when we cut it against this, we need to be able to cut this against that. OK, so we need to be able to get back and forth. So oh, OK. So in this case, um, this could be a gamma. And then the conclusion would also have to be a gamma for consistency. OK. OK. Hmm? I actually think we don't want that cut. Mm. I could be wrong. No, I, I think we do want that cut. Okay. Yeah, pretty sure. Ah, uh, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So in these, ca these cases are relatively nice because is, if one of the two formulas is in focus, you cannot have something that goes into focus on the wrong side, so to speak. Okay. Um, but we do have to, let's, let's just take this. If this was in focus here and there was nothing in focus here, and we would put delta prime, we would apply the focus left rule to delta prime, right? then we couldn't push up the cut on that side. Right? So what did we do in that case? Well, actually, we just move it past. And the reason is because this A, there's no, fo no, no focus in delta. OK, because it's one here. OK. And therefore, it's OK to be there one in delta prime because it's the only thing that shows up down here. OK. And if the right-hand side is in focus, that would be the only focus here, so we get into here. So when we do this kind of a cut, that's like the nice case. 
Okay, then we can just push it up all the way until we have a, the a left rule matching up with the right or a left rule matching up with the right. Okay. So this, these are the nice cases. So this is actually the hard part, this original cut. Because if you focus on something here and you focus on something here, how do you proceed? Okay. <clears throat> so this better work, so the whole lecture was for nothing. Any ideas? Okay, so if this is a well-formed cut, then there's only one focus formula down here, right? So then there already has to be a focus either here or here, let's say, okay? Um, so if there's one focus here and we introduce a new one here, how can we actually proceed in that case? So the idea is that this focus here, focus here, we keep this formula E the same it is, this whole proof E the same it is it is, and we have push, it, push it up on this side, and we don't actually push it up into here at all. We'll lock this down and we push it up here. Okay? So remember we had a choice before, when you had a cut, where the, where the cut formula was a side formula in both premises. We could push it up on the one side, or we could push it up on the other side. And it didn't matter which way we pushed it up, right, because it was a symmetric situation, and our strategy was not really built into our cut elimination proof. We just pushed it up. Remember that we had that choice? We kept the one proof the same, and we made the other one smaller. Right? That was even our induction measure said. Either the formula gets smaller, and then the proofs don't matter, or the formula stays the same, and one proof gets smaller, and the other one stays the same, or the other way around. Right? So if it's a side formula on both sides, we have our choice which way we push it up. Okay? So if if there's already a, um, a, a focus formula conclusion, and so it comes from here, and we would be introducing new one here, just not, let's not push it up into here, let's push it up into the other side, okay? And keep this formula the same, okay? So there's no focus formula in the conclusion, okay? And yet push it up on this side, okay? There's already a focus formula here, so you can push up past everything. The only reason you have to be worried about doing that is eventually you can't push it up anymore because A is a principal formula of the inference, right? Okay. But that would mean that because it's not in focus, it would be one of these invertible rules, and then you stop here. Okay. And then you can go over here until the place where A becomes in focus, and then we can use this induction hypothesis down here. Okay. So there's enough slack in the way that we did our cut elimination that we can still make it go through here okay, if you're just careful in which, which side of the inference we push it up. Okay. Where these are the easy cases, and this is a case where you have to be a little bit careful to make sure that you push it up on the correct side in order to maintain this invariant. Okay, okay so there's a lot of checking that has to be done, um, but I think still it's linear in the number of cases. Do you, would you agree, Rob? It's linear in the number of inference rules. Maybe I had a constant factor. Yeah, yeah, it's linear because you, you consider all the rules here, um, we're keeping this the same, all the rules here, keeping that the same. And there will be a lot fewer possibility than before, okay, but they're still all there. Okay. Okay, so if you trust me at that level of detail, okay, um, then we have cut and we have identity, and therefore we can prove this little lemma here, and that gets our overall proof. It finishes our overall proof, and then we know that this system of, um, of chaining here is complete with respect to the previous system of um, uh, cut free sequence calculus with atomic initial sequence. Okay. All right, so um, let's see what else. Okay, now I wanted to do focusing, okay? And I just wanted to explain what focusing is. So we had two pieces now, okay? So the way to think about it is like this. Um, so here we have 
our sequence calculus the way we defined it before. So here we have cut, okay, an identity. And then we have two kind of refinements here, okay. So here is um, cut free sequence calculus, okay, and here is the chain sequence calculus. And we also, actually the wrong place here, we investigated what invertibility rules we can have, okay. Now, if you force that invertible rules are always applied, and you also force chaining, so that there's only one formula in focus, at most one formula in focus, then you get a system down here, which is, which is Andrioli's original focusing system. So it combines both of the ideas that we had so far. Um, and you can actually get it from this system quite easily. What you say, that at this rule here, okay, and at this rule here, we force the fact that in delta there cannot be invertible propositions and C cannot be invertible on the right. Okay. So all you have to do, it's the same rules, you just change your site condition on these two rules. Okay. Everything else stays the same. Okay. So that will force you, before you can focus on something, to decompose everything that's, that can be decomposed asynchronously because it has an invertible rule. So you break it down and what is left, what can be left in delta after you've broken down all the invertible rules. So focusing, so these rules, so these side conditions here, we have a side condition on that and we have a side condition on C. So what's the side condition on delta? Yeah? Okay. So only negative. Okay. Only negative propositions because those are not invertible. Okay. And atoms are also allowed. Um, well, negative atoms are included in here, but positive atoms could also be in there because you can't also break them down. And what is our restriction on C? has to be symmetric, right? Just positive propositions and negative atoms, okay? Okay, so we get the focusing system if we do that. Now let's make sure that we do not messing anything up if we do that. So um, now at that point, okay, if you focus on something, and, and this is always negative proposition and positive atoms, this is positive atoms and negative atomic propositions, then we cannot apply any rule here or here. The only rules we can apply are to the formula in focus, okay? Um, because the other rules are not invertible, so these, this rule, for example, couldn't possibly apply because the right-hand side needs to be negative. Uh, this rule couldn't possibly apply because the left-hand side needs to be positive, which you ruled out, okay? Um, so the only thing we can do is decompose the thing which is the formula which is in focus, okay? Until we either succeed, okay, or we have to blur. And in that case, we're back into something where we can apply invertible rules, okay? So in this kind of system, proof search proceeds in kind of two phases, okay? So one phase is you apply all the invertible rules until you cannot do that anymore, okay? And then you come to a sequence that looks like this, where you have everything is negative for positive atoms, and the right-hand side is just positive or negative atom, and then you have to decide where to focus. Okay, but only at that point. Once you focus, you have to apply all the rules just to the formula in focus. Nothing else is possible. Um, and you decompose it until you're finished or you blur again into a situation where you can apply inversion. Then you go through all the inversion until you get stuck into a sequence where you're gonna have to make a decision what to focus on, okay? So that's an extremely restricted system with, uh, compared to um, um, sort of uh, this sequence calculus here where you can apply any left or right rule at any point in time, okay? And even more restricted than this, where you can apply cut at any time, okay? Um, and it's more restricted than either of these two because it forces inversion, and it forces that when you focus, because it's the only formula that you can apply an inference to until you leave focus, okay? And um, so that was the, the brilliance of Andreoli who came up with that kind of a, a um, sort of a decomposition of the search space. Now, a really interesting thing is that this kind of picture applies to just about any logic that I know of. Okay, so it can apply to classical logic, it can apply to intuitionistic logic, to linear logic, to modal logic, 
whatever. If there's sensible logic, this picture seems to apply. I don't really know why that's the case, but that's an observation. That so far I haven't found any logic for which you cannot make this kind of a focusing system. Okay. Um, so therefore it's a very, very important concept because it seems to be shared by all lots of different logics. Okay. But in different logics there's different phenomenon that don't appear in linear logic, or let's say they're isolated in linear logic in a nice place. So in other logics, the connectors don't necessarily have a unique polarity, positive or negative. Okay. Um, so for example, you can arrange it in uh, intuitionistic logic, conjunction could be positive or negative. And that's because width and tensor really are the same connective. Okay. So you kind of have a choice to make. In the same way that we have a choice to make here for atomic propositions. Whenever you see a conjunction, you can decide that that instance is going to be positive or negative, And you have to make that choice. In the, in the uh, uh, linear case, it's all very pure. Okay. Um, okay, so um, let me make some more uh, finishing remarks on this because we need to worry about the um, uh, persistent resources. Okay, so we need to say a few words about those. Um, okay, so the theorem still goes through, um, but we do need to worry about what the system actually looks like. So what we do is, of course, we add gamma everywhere. Okay, so, so the rules that are here don't really change. Um, and we have three new rules, right? One is a copy rule. Uh, actually, let me write it like this this time. And A is in gamma. Okay, so we keep it in gamma, but we also get a copy of it. And then what we're going to do this time is that we force, when we copy something out of gamma, this thing to be in focus. Okay. Um, there's a restriction here, uh, similar to these, but not exactly the same. Okay. And that restriction is that we cannot focus on a positive atom. Okay. Um, okay. Because um, what would happen is that we would just lose control over it here and it would just end up in delta, and we could do that arbitrarily often. Okay. So there's a restriction there. Um, then the, right, the left rule is going to be like this. We're just going to move it into gamma and drop it from delta. Okay. So there's not much going on here. That rule is invertible, because bang itself is a positive formula. So the left rule is invertible. And then on the right, this has to be empty. And we have to be in focus on that. OK, so that's the bang right rule. That's the bang left rule. And what happens is that okay, we actually lose the focus in that rule. Okay. So I'm not going to show you a, re a reason why this has to be the case. I'll ask you to do that for the homework assignment. Okay. So unlike the other rules, where the premises always inherit the focus, okay, for the bang right rule, we actually have to lose the focus for the system to remain complete. Um, okay, and we need to change this rule a little bit because when you try to prove the identity theorem, okay, um, and it turns out that there's a positive atom in gamma, you won't be able to complete that because we're not allowed to focus on it to put it into this context. So we have one more rule that looks like this. If the context is empty and we're focused on P plus, then we can succeed if P plus is one of our formulas in gamma. Okay. And that's because we made that restriction over here um, that we're not allowed to focus on a positive atom. Uh, okay, so that's a system with bang, and it's a little bit, it's not 100% as, as simple as before um, because of these couple of things that are going on here, in particular the fact that you lose focus when you, when you go underneath the bang. Okay. okay, so now in the last uh, 15 minutes, um, I want to show you some applications of this. Um, okay. I want a particularly nice application. Um, wasn't realized until 
um, maybe 10 years after the original paper by Andreoli. Okay. Um, it has to do with going back and forth between inference rules and propositions. Okay. So we started with inference rules. For example, we said something like this. If you have a, a dime and a dime and a nickel, then we can get a quarter. And then we ran into trouble with this notation when we had implications because we had to introduce resources which could be consumed but only in the subproof. So it was very difficult to track this in this kind of notation. So we said, okay, let's change this. Let's make this into, uh, actually, let's use a tensor here, into Q. And let's make this persistent because our inference rules, we can use as often as we want. So we take the inference rules and we express it as a proposition, OK? Um, remember this, how we, how we did this? We were taking all the inference rules and we were able to reformulate the propositions. And there were a few things that we couldn't previously express, which we now can, OK? In particular, when we had hypothetical assumptions, OK? So now with focusing, you can actually go back from here to here. So let's see how that works, OK? So let's assume we have a persistent formula and we're trying to prove um, from delta, um, we're trying to prove some conclusion C, okay? So that's, that's the thing we're trying to do. And we have this assumption, so we want to focus on that, okay? So what does it actually look like in the, in the way we, okay, so I should write it like this. So we have gamma, and this formula here is in gamma, okay? So this is one of the things we can focus on. OK, so then after the first step, it looks like this. We have gamma, which are always going to be the same, so I'll ignore that. We have delta, OK? And we also now have delta d cross d cross n, get this q, and that's going to be in focus. We're still proving c. So before we continue, uh, actually, no, we can continue for, for just a second longer. OK, so what happens now? We have to apply implication left, OK? Um, and so we have to split our context. And from delta 1, we have to prove d tensor d tensor n. And here from delta 2 and q in focus, we have to prove c. OK, so at this point, it might be good to know whether D, D, and N would be positive or negative, so that we could actually figure out how the proof completes. Okay. So let's start out um, and let's make everything negative. Okay. So all these are negative. Okay, so what happens in that case? Um, okay. So let's look at the second premise first. What happens with that? We're focused on Q negative, okay? And we're trying to prove C from delta 2. Hmm? Okay, well, we have to look at our rules. Hopefully, they're still up there. Right, so the only rule that applies, right, would be this one here, right? Because we're focused on a negative atom on the left. So the only way that we can actually make progress there if the Q minus, if C is the right-hand side is Q minus, right? And there's no other formulas. So what we infer is delta 2 must be empty and C is Q minus, right? So if I'm allowed to do that here, I would do it like this. So delta 2 disappears. This is Q minus. This is Q minus. And this must be Q minus in order to be able to focus on that, OK? And of course, then this follows. OK, so delta 2 disappears. So this is just delta, and this is just delta. OK, gamma is the same everywhere, OK? Now what happens over here on the other side? We'll focus on a tensor. Right? You break that up, and you focus on the components, so we find um, if I can abbreviate that a little bit, we find delta 1 arrow d minus, delta 2 arrow d minus, and 
delta 3 arrow n minus, right? Okay? So now what happens when you focus on d minus on the right? You focus on a negative formula on the right. We apply the blur rule, hopefully. Because we're focused, we're not allowed to continue the focus. So this becomes delta 1 arrow d minus out of focus. OK, so if I want to summarize this rule, now it looks like this. If from delta 1, I can prove d minus. From delta 2, I can prove d minus. And from delta 3, I can prove n minus. Then, putting delta 1, delta 2, and delta 3 together, I can prove Q minus. Right? That's exactly what this rule said, except we weren't explicit about it. Right? So if you have a D minus, and a D minus, and an N minus, then you can get a Q. So by focusing on the formula that represents the rule, you can recover the rule. Okay. The interesting thing is if you do that, you can throw away this rule, uh, this formula altogether and replace it by the rule. And if you do that for all the formulas, okay, um, you can get a big step inference rule system, okay, where the only steps you can take is going from proving Q minus directly proving D minus, D minus, and N minus, instead of doing all these small intermediate steps. Okay. Um, and the theorem provers that I've worked on all are based on this principle, okay, because they replace many small inferences that I did here Okay, with one big step inference while retaining completeness. Okay. Um, okay, so we should do one more example. And actually, I'll use the same example, but I make everything positive. Okay, yeah. If you didn't want to commit to a polarity on the, on the atoms, yeah. Yeah, but then you would lose. Right, yes, I know you lose. <laughs> yeah, the problem is, this is a very strong restriction that this will fail if the thing over here. So if you have that kind of a rule, you would lose that because you could get out of it. So you don't want to do that. Now, um, you have to assign a consistent polarity to the atoms because if some occurrences become positive and some become negative, you won't be able to complete the proof. Like P plus arrow P minus, you won't be able to prove. So all the occurrence of the atom need to get the same polarity, yeah? But that admissible rule, when you proved earlier, does mean that if you can prove P out of focus, you can prove it. <coughs> yes, that's and true. So, so you can use that. You just can't get that as an implication. But in this instance, you get that as a rule. So I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. I'm saying is that you will not be able to prove this. Right. I don't think Yeah, that's what I was si saying. You have to take, when you have a proposition, which has multiple occurrences in your formula, you have to assign it the same polarity everywhere. Otherwise, you might have something that can be proven, P implies P, before you polarize things, and afterwards you cannot prove it anymore. Are okay. there further, I assume there are further restrictions on, it's not just the same atom that has to be assigned the same polarity. No, that's all that you need. Really? Yeah, that's all that you need. For each atom, you can make a separate decision on what polarity to assign it to, completely arbitrary, but consistent on that same atom. Um, so, but let's just see what happens. Yeah? For the one step rule, yeah. is it possible that there are bogus propositions uh, in the delta? In the one left rule. In the weak focusing system, that's the case. In the chaining system. In the full focusing system, um, you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Of the proof, it's possible to have one, so some garbage there. Like, 
No, because the initial sequence, you cannot have anything else. It's a linear logic. So the initial rule, um, okay, this is the only formula here, nothing else. The only thing that could be allowed could be gamma, but no other linear things. No. Right, but by the invariant under strong focusing, you're not allowed to have anything invertible in the context when you're focused on something. Yes, we're using fully focused, the fully focused, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so otherwise, this might be provable in other ways if there's things in delta that are allowed, so they're not allowed here. Um, okay, so let's do the, the so if we, if we focus on this where everything is negative, we get this rule, okay? If we, if we focus on where everything is positive, let's see what happens. Okay, and I'll finish the with that. So we have in our context d plus tensor d plus tensor n plus proves q plus. And this is in focus. Now fill in the rest of the sequence as we go along. Okay. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we know how, what happens here. That's the same thing as before. We have to prove d plus tensor d plus tensor n plus here, and here we have to use q plus to prove the right-hand side, right? Okay, uh, what happens here? We're focused on q plus on the left-hand side. What happens there? Hmm? Blur. We blur because it's a, a positive formula in focus, so we lose it. So what happens here is that um, there's going to be a, a delta that's allowed here, and we have Q plus in it, and the right-hand side could be any formula C. Right? Right. So now we have to thread the delta through. Okay? Um, okay, well, let's call this a delta prime. Well, okay, let's call it delta. Let's fix thing at the end. What happens here when I'm focused on this on the left hand on the right hand side in the first premise? Yeah, I, I do two two times the tensor right rule because I'm allowed to do that I'm focused on it. So I got D plus still in focus. I get D plus still in focus and I get N plus still in focus. Okay? Now what happens here? I come to D plus in focus. The context must be D plus, right? Unless I have it somewhere in gamma, but I, let's assume I don't, okay? I don't have somebody who produces money for me arbitrarily, not like your ATMs, okay? So I have D plus here. This context must be D plus, and this context must be N plus. So here then I have D plus, D plus, and N plus, okay? And here the conclusion I would have d plus, d plus, and n plus, n delta. Okay. So then what the derived rule would say, if this is a, something that I have unrestricted, um, so I have d plus, d plus, n plus, and delta, I'm going to try to achieve some goal. Then these are finished because they're instance of the identity. Okay, so then if you read off the derived rule, it doesn't look like this what the derived rule looks like is it will have d plus, d plus, n plus, and delta, and I'm trying to achieve any goal at all. I can replace this by q together with delta. Still, my goal is the same, okay? So what this says, if I have two dimes and a nickel, I can replace it by a quarter in my proof search, okay? And so this one, the previous rule said, um, if I'm trying to get a quarter, I can achieve that by getting a dime and a dime and a nickel. Okay. This says, if I have two dimes and a nickel, I can replace it by a quarter. Okay. So those are the two derived rules that we get uh, from focusing. Okay. 
And the interesting thing is the completeness of focusing says you cannot throw away your formula, just use the derived rule. And it was our choice which of the two derived rules we wanted. Okay, either of the two derived rules will work perfectly well. We know that by the completeness of focusing. So we can pick either one. Okay. And you see that the proof search, the, 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 the search space will be very different. Okay. In one case, it's a goal-directed search because what the rule really looks like to be precise, would be delta 1, delta 2, delta 3. And here, we do it like this. OK, so we'd have to, our goal would have to be, be to get a quarter, and that's the only place we could apply this rule. And then say, so split up your resources and get two dimes and a nickel. And this just sort of opportunistically, right, if you have two dimes and a nickel, trade it in for a quarter and continue. OK. Um, so the search space for these two solutions is very, very different. Okay. Um, but the very nice thing about all of this is that inference can proceed in very big steps. A lot of choices are taken away from you um, by, the, by these techniques of inversion and chaining. If you put them together and you get focusing, it's even more directed. And so we actually had some empirical data on that, but it has a huge impact on the performance of search if you can do this kind of focusing. Um, now, in practice, there are problems with this kind of thing. Um, in particular, you don't always want to do inversion. That's basically um, the lesson that we learned. And the reason is, it's actually um, clear. If, if your right-hand side looks like this, A plus B comma C plus D, comma E plus F, okay, da, 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 okay. And you're trying to prove something over here, okay. What this will do, it will force you to apply the left rule to this one, okay. That gives you how many subproofs? Two, and all of them will copy all of this, right? And then you apply the left rule to this one, which will give you two in, on each of the sides. And this will give you two on each of the sides. So you get exponentially many different um, sub goals. Okay? So even to generate the rule that would correspond to this under focusing, okay, we'll never terminate, right? So you know, we put this formula, you know, there's challenge problems we put into our theorem prover, and the first thing it does generate big step rules. Okay? Never finishes. Okay? <laughs> okay. Once we've if we had generated all of them, the proof would be trivial, right? Um, but we never get there. Okay. Um, and so basically, you have to be extremely careful in applying inversion, okay, because it can multiply um, exponentially. Um, and, but we found a technique for solving that, and not in the next lecture, but after the next segment of the uh, course, I will actually talk about that. There's a technique called, hmm? Weak focusing. No, weak focusing um, is too weak. We don't want that, okay. So we actually use a technique called polarization. Okay, in order to, to eliminate that, that issue. So, but like, I don't want to talk about that now, but I will talk, come back to that. Okay. So what I will start next week, um, I will go back and I'll talk about functional programming, natural deduction, okay. and rather than having the sequent calculus, and we'll talk about um, what kind of applications linear logic has in relation to functional programming. So we already had some connections to concurrency, now we'll see connections to uh, uh, functional programming. Okay, and like I said at the beginning, this third homework assignment will come out soon, and the second one was due today, so hopefully um, you'll all get it done today. Okay. All right, sorry for running over here. <laughs>